Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to help keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive method of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. Subjects range from dog behavior, stress-free training, and other tools to help you understand your relationship with your dog. If you like the webinar, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Click the notification bell and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll be notified when future videos are posted. We would also appreciate it if you would make a tax-deductible donation to support our mission of providing stress-free dog education resources. You can find a donation button located at the top of our channel page and at the top of the Your Dog's Friend webpage. A link to our webpage along with the speaker's contact info are listed in the description for this video. Now enjoy the webinar. Hello everyone. Welcome to your Dog's Friend webinar series. And today we're going to be talking about inside at-home activities, a topic that's particularly timely now as the weather gets colder, at least on the East Coast, but well in all seasons. Um, before we start, though, let me introduce you to one of our favorite speakers, Laura Sharkey. Um, Laura has owned and trained at Wolf's Dog Training in Arlington, Virginia, since 2002. She is certified by Karen Pryor Academy, a highly respected training program for positive trainers. And I just found out that Laura also has a PhD in microbiology and immunology, which somehow explains why she now has been a dog trainer for so many years. Um, please put your questions in chat. Uh, Laura's gonna monitor it. She may answer some questions as we go. Most will probably wait until the end. We'll get to as many as possible though. Um, I know that you'll learn a lot from today's webinar. We've done it before and it was great, which is why we brought it back. I'm turning it over to you, Laura. Hey everybody, um, welcome to um, this talk, um, calling it Winter Games, but of course it's all about enrichment and doing things with your dog which obviously can happen all year round. The focus today is mostly on indoor stuff. Um, so we are just gonna get started. And I do like monitoring the questions. So if you have any questions, just throw them in the chat and I will get to as many of them as I can either during or at the end. So um, I will get started and I apologize if my dogs bark in the background. Winter games. A question that a recent um, puppy client of mine asked, she was a first time dog and puppy owner and her question, and she says it was a silly question. I thought it was a brilliant question. But her question was, what does my puppy do all day? <laughs> and she said, oh, I, I just don't know. What does she do all day? And I said, well, you know what? That's a really good question. What does she do all day? Um, and without us, there isn't a lot for your dog to do all day because they don't have a job to go to. So they don't have eight hours of work that they have to do a day and they don't have any household chores that they need to get done to fill up the other parts of their day. And... They can't go out and get exercise on their own like we can if we want to go to a gym or go for a run or go play a sport. Um, and they can't curl up with a good book uh, on a rainy afternoon and just delve into the latest, um, most interesting thing on their to read list. So what does your dog do all day? And the answer is a lot of dogs are bored and a lot of dogs are bored and waiting for us to provide them with some sort of environmental enrichment. And it is up to us to provide the environmental stimulation necessary for our dog's psychological and physical well-being because if we don't do that, there are some serious consequences and some people will end up with something like this. 
if you don't give your dog some psychological and physical activity, they might create some on their own. And as a dog trainer, we see this a lot. We see a lot of questions from people saying, hey, my dog is biting me all the time, especially with puppies, puppy mouthing, they want to play. Or my puppy is chewing on all of my uh, sofa cushions or destroying the molding or the, the, the fringe on the rug. Um, and the answer to most of these questions is, well, we have to give them things that they can do because telling them, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other thing, now don't do this again, um, isn't very effective because all we're telling them is what not to do. And the best way to help your puppy or your uh, older dog is to give them things to do. And what we want to do is give them some playtime, give them something that they enjoy doing. And we know that play or downtime is important for everyone. Children play all the time, young kids. We sign them up for sports classes and we invite other children over for play dates. We buy all sorts of blocks and toys and things for them to use their imagination and we send them out to run around and play tag or pokemon go or whatever the thing is that children are doing riding bikes roller skating there's a lot to be said for downtime for play and then a lot of times we Join in as the adults. We do fun things with our kids. We go camping. We uh, go hiking. We play some sports. We do whatever. And then even as adults, these are some very young adults, but even as adults, it's important to have some downtime. It's important to do something. Play looks a lot different in the adult world. For me, play can be going to see a movie I enjoy bird watching. Um, I do enjoy hiking with my dogs. So play takes on sort of a different um, look and feel to adults than it does to children, but it is still really critically important to our physical and mental well being, right? And so if we think about how important it is to our children, we can you know, make the leap to understanding how important it is for a puppy. It's especially important to a puppy. And then when we think about our downtime and what we like to do, we have to think, okay, well, what does my dog like to do? What does my dog do all day? And if they had a choice, what would they like to do all day? Um, and if we start thinking about these questions, we can start putting together an enrichment plan for our dogs and our cats and our birds and whatever little critters you have, hamsters, guinea pigs, whatever. Um, all animals require enrichment. Um, turtles, fish, everybody. Today, obviously, I'm talking about dogs, but hopefully this will spur some um, ideas about what to do for the other pets in your world as well. So when we talk about play, we talk about, we, we, we call it a lot of the times we call it enrichment. And what I'm here to tell everybody today is enrichment is both more fun and it takes less time than you think. I know I personally am easily demotivated by the idea of oh my gosh, I have to go do this thing with the dogs and I have to prepare this, that, or the other. And it's really easy for me to be like, oh, I just can't today. Um, and what I want to point out is that enrichment can be really, really easy for the human. And it can actually be a lot more fun once you actually get up and do it. There's a few ingredients that you are going to need to enrich and play with your dog. You're going to need about 15 minutes a day, which is sort of a minimum. If you want to do a lot more, I'm sure your dogs would be thrilled because they certainly need more than 15 minutes of enrichment a day. 
Um, you can use their special treats or their dinner, their dog food. You can use their toys. You can have some toys on hand, maybe some special toys uh, that are particularly interesting. We'll talk about that. You might have some training goals and say, well, you know what? I've really been wanting to teach my dog to give me a high five or jump over a pillow or something like that. Um, so a training goal is always helpful to keep in mind. I'm going to show you all some food puzzles today that are really, really interesting and can be enriching for dogs. And then the last thing you really, really need is just a positive attitude. You have to say, okay, I'm doing this for the dog. What would the dog want? Because a lot of the times we do things with our dogs and it's what we want to do. And we just bring the dog along. Um, I know a lot of people when it's warmer will take their dogs to cafes or to dinner outside on a patio. And I always, always have to ask, do you really think your dog is enjoying that? Or do you just like having your dog there? If your dog is enjoying it, that's great. But I know most dogs do not want to lie under the table sniffing lots and lots of food and aromas that they are not allowed to have for two hours with nothing else to do. So when we're talking about enrichment, we really, really want to think about, hey, what does my dog want to be doing? What can I do for the dog? Not for me and the dog just comes along. And here's a caveat. If your dog enjoys going out with you to restaurants or for coffee, absolutely do it. Have fun. Have your dog meet people. That's great. But always keep an eye on and say, hey, is my dog really enjoying this? So I've got a slide warning. The next slide is a little bit of PG-13. Um, so if there are any sensitive viewers or listeners, um, just a little bit of warning. It's not that bad but I wanna talk about play in dogs is um, modified predatory behavior, right? So almost all the ways dogs play and puppies play and even young animals in the wild. So who hasn't watched some, you know, tiger cubs pouncing on each other or pouncing on a plastic a paper bag or something like that, or, um, wolf puppies running around and tumbling and, and crouching and stalking and stuff like that, right? It's adorable. In wild animals, all of those behaviors are really just practice for when they grow up to be adult wild animals and actually have to use those skills to catch their dinners and keep themselves alive. alive. In dogs, Luckily for us, all of these behaviors stay most of the time in the play zone, in the practice zone, and they don't actually become real. But the hunt attack sequence is very, very typical for most large animals. And it invi involves first the dog seeing or the animal see the wild animal seeing the thing stalking the thing, chasing the thing down, catching it, killing it, and then eating it. Um, and in our dogs, the hunt attack sequence has been modified so that we have dogs that are primarily bred to hunt things. We have dogs that like to track. We have bloodhounds. We have pointers. We have dogs that have been bred primarily foxhounds, right? Uh, dachshunds who hunt badgers. We have a lot of dogs that are bred specifically to hunt things and thus enjoy tracking and following scent. Anybody out there has a beagle, you know that you have a scent hound and they like to put their noses to the ground and sniff everything and sniff and sniff and sniff till their heart's content. Then you also have the next part, which is the eye stalk sequence. And if anybody out there has a herding dog, border collies, cattle dogs, 
Australian Shepherds. That's what those dogs are primarily bred for. They are bred to eye and stalk. However, they don't chase, catch, kill, or consume because that part is not part that we want to encourage. We want them to simply do these first two parts, the eye and the stalking of the critter, not obviously the getting of the critter. Um, but dogs do like to catch, chase and catch things, which is why we have the number one um, thing that people like to do with their dogs is fetch. Dogs like to chase rapidly retreating objects. If the rapidly retreating object is a frisbee or a ball, then we call it play. If the rapidly retreating object is a child or a bicycle or a car, then that can be a problem, right? But to the dog, it's all the same. Something is leaving quickly, running away, and I am pre-programmed to go after it, right? So if you have a dog that likes to chase and catch, then we would want to focus on these retrieval games more than we would want to focus on, say, a sniffing game. The killing part, we simulate that with um, tug games, right? There's a bunch of dogs in a stream or a lake pulling on a, a rope or a tug toy, right? We do a lot of tug play. I love tug play. Tug play is good. We're going to talk about it a little bit more. And that is the sort of grabbing the thing and tearing it up part of play, right? Luckily in our world, when they grab things and tear them up, most of the time it looks like this, where your little stuffed animal toy ends up being shredded and stuffing is left all over the place. Again, when dogs do this to the toys that we purposely buy for them, we consider it a very positive thing. And, oh, good boy, did you play with your thing? Oh, that was so great. And when they do that to our sofa cushions, we say, oh, my gosh, bad dog. I can't believe you did that. Right? So, again, for the dog, it's all the same. They're like, look, I am bored. I need something to do. I am either going to herd your children or the neighborhood cats or maybe you should take me for some sheep uh, herding lessons. If you like to chase things, maybe you need to get your dog doing some disc dog so that they chase appropriate things and not joggers and bikers and small children running in the neighborhood. Um, and then the same thing with chewing and destroying things. They like to tug on things. They like to sniff on their walks. They like to destroy toys. I remember when I was a young dog owner, I would be so annoyed when my dog would unstuff the toys and I would actually stuff them back in and like sew them up and give it back to the dog. And the dog would just de-stuff it all again. And finally I realized, you know what? It is their toy. I am buying this toy for the dog. Let the dog do what it wants with it. And if it means that I need to buy more toys, well, then that's what it means. Um, yes, Rebecca has a great question. Is chewing sticks, pulling out landscaping to make a stick is the same thing in this behavior range? Absolutely. Most dogs, especially dogs under two years old, have an innate desire to chew, 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 chew. Um, I tell puppy owners that from, um, from three weeks of age, when their eyes and their ears open till about five and a half months of age is the, is the chewing, uh, the mouthing stage where your dog is putting everything in their mouth, exploring everything, biting, 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 but they've got very small teeth. It's very, very painful, but they don't do a lot of destruction. After the adult teeth come in at five and a half to six months, um, till about two years, the that is the destructive chewing stage. And that is when you need to supply your dog with very large sticks or bully sticks or pig ears or marrow bones or whatever it is. Because again, if you don't provide them with the things that they need, they are going to find something. Um, I would say, Rebecca, I also let my dogs chew sticks. I don't care that they chew sticks. 
um, preferably outside of the house. My young eight month old dog is constantly bringing sticks inside the house. Um, we are still working on that. Um, but of course we want to make sure that they're only chewing the sticks and not consuming them. Dogs that chew, um, pick up mulch. Oh, black mouth cur is unbelievably chewy. And at 15 months, the good news for you, Rebecca, is this is the worst time for that, right? It's an adolescent dog. They chew all the time. And as long as you provide them with appropriate things to chew, you're going to be in much better shape than just saying, don't chew this, don't chew this, don't chew this, because they are genetically driven to want to chew things. Again, what I was saying about the sticks, make sure they're not consuming too much. If your dog is eating leaves or eating small twigs and stuff, that's not a problem. We just want to make sure they're not eating an enormous amount of, of uh, you know, large wood chips or large sticks. I watch when my dogs choose a stick. When your dog sits down with a stick, when they are done chewing the stick, there should be a shredded pile of pieces of stick. If it all disappears, then the dog is eating it and that's not good, right? So you want to pay very close attention to what your dog is chewing up and destroying and what they are consuming because we have to prevent them, obviously, from consuming things that they should not be eating. I apologize. My dogs are barking in the background. I think it's, I think it's the mailman. I'm going to, Steffi, good girl. There we go. All right. So let's go on. This is my last PG-13 sl slide. Just uh, a little bit about the hunt attack sequence and how most, if not all dog play is some aspect, some piece of that modified into a slightly different um, situation. So today I want to talk about five easy options for you to provide your dog with fun and enrichment. The first thing I'm going to talk about is sniff walks. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is traditional games like fetching and tugging. The third thing I'm going to talk about is food games, stuff that your dog can do, um, finding food or um, getting food out of puzzles. Talk a little bit about training games. One of my, my, the things I enjoy the most doing, which is training games. And then I, I don't have a lot about search games. Search games um, are very, very similar to food games. I am going to show you one search game, which is also a food game. And we'll talk a little bit about some more um, formalized options for searching. I want to point out two of these, stiff walks and food games. These things you are already doing. Those of you who take your dogs on three walks a day, you are already walking the dog. With a little bit of modification, you can make this a much more enriching, um, mental, mentally challenging game and more um, both physically and mentally exhausting. Okay. And then the other thing is we feed our dogs every single day. We are already feeding our dogs every day. There are things we can do with their food to make it much more interesting for them rather than just putting their food in a bowl. I have timed my dogs and all of my dogs can eat two cups of food in about two minutes, right? So I'm going to be feeding them those two cups of food every single day, no matter what I might as well turn it into something that is a little bit more interesting for their dogs. So let's start with walking. You can easily, very, very easily get more bang for your dog walking buck, right? You're walking your dog for 15 minutes, three or four times a day. Anyhow, probably longer if you have a puppy. Here are some ideas. Let the dog choose the route, okay? If you're you want to go to the left because you want to pass your friend's house, but your dog wants to go to the right, maybe go to the right 50 to 60% of the time. Okay. Let your dog choose the route and let them sniff as much as they want to. Um, so many of the times when we are on a walk with our dog, it's like distance is important. I must walk four blocks in seven minutes, and get the dog back in the house so I can get back to work or get ready for dinner for the kids or whatever. 
I'm going to tell you that the amount of distance your dog walks in terms of miles or blocks is not nearly as important as you think it is. And if you let them sniff more and engage in their environment more, rather than sort of doing these forced marches, you are going to have a much better exercise dog because they're going to be exercised both physically and mentally. Um, another thing I want is if you live in an area where there's a lot of space, you can experiment with a long line. If your dog is on a 12 foot leash, they're going to get three times as much exercise as if they were on a six foot leash and they will run back and forth a heck of a lot more than um, you're going to be running. So for anyone who um, does any off leash hiking or, or hiking with their dogs on a long line. If you walk one mile, your dog probably walks or runs three miles because they are sniffing to the right and sniffing to the left and going forward and doubling back and moving forward again. Whereas humans, we tend to, they were very linear. We're like, hike, hike, straight, 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 follow the path, follow the path. And I know when I'm doing that, I'm following my path and my dog is running to the right and then they're running to the left and they're running ahead and then I call them back and I give them a treat and then they run off again and so they are moving at least three times as many miles as I am doing. Um, so only if you live in an area where there is a, a wooded area or a big field or something like that, experiment with giving your dog a little bit more leash, putting them on a longer leash and letting them um, do a little bit more exploring. And then if possible, even if it's just once a week, go someplace new. And I mean new, I mean like not the three blocks you normally walk around, put your dog in the car, travel five minutes up the road and let your dog sniff in a new park, a different park than the normal park that you may walk through or the normal blocks in a neighborhood that you walk through. All of these things are going to give your dog a much more enriching walk than normally we kind of just put them on a walk. The last thing I'm going to say about taking your dog for a walk, I beg of you, I beg all of you, please, please, please get off your phone. Watch what your dog is doing. Bring treats with you so you can reinforce good behavior. We are on our phones all the time, all day. If you are going for a walk with your dog for 15 minutes, it is 15 minutes that you can get off your phone and pay attention to your dog. Also, it's a huge safety issue. You can't see if your dog is getting into trouble and you can't see if there are other animals in the area that might be causing trouble. So really, please pay attention to your phone, uh, to your dog and not your phone if possible. Um, we are gonna close the door and let my dogs out of the other room. He can stay, he's fine. All right, so here is a little video I took of a little golden retriever puppy I've been working with for the past few months. And we took her on a little sniff walk. And I wanna show you. This is Chloe and she's sniffing. Caleb, stop. And we're letting her sniff. The trainer, I'm videoing. The trainer's got the leash. <laughs> and now the puppy's carrying the leash. Perfectly okay to let the puppy carry the leash. Why? Because she's a retriever. She loves doing that. And then within a few seconds, she's back to sniffing. And she decides, oh, I'm going back the way we just came. Humans never do that. Right? But we're letting Chloe go back the other way. See, Erica has the leash really loose. She's holding it up and towards the dog. Chloe alerts to something. She sees or hears something. Erica has treats in her pocket. She gives out the treats. And then Chloe decides we're crossing that little driveway and we're gonna go sniff over here. She sees a person. Good girl, Chloe. Good girl. And she gets reinforced for wagging at the person. Then she comes and sees me because I'm her primary trainer, right? So that was only like a minute and a half of this little walk for this dog. If you do that for 15 minutes, 
it is an amazing experience for the dog, right? So there was, it's only a minute, a minute and 28 seconds. I'm going to show it again and just show all the little things that were going on in just that minute and a half. Again, loose leash, dog is sniffing. She actually bites something here. That is not poop, folks. But she's biting the grass there. I don't freak out about that. Dogs bite. They explore everything with their mouths. She comes back. She's sniffing. She came to me. Then we're letting her carry the leash. We're letting her do a little bit of tugging. And we're walking and letting her take the lead. Wherever she wants to go, we're going. And she drops the leash and goes back to sniffing. Sniffing under the tree, going forward, going forward. And then she's going backwards. And Erica just says, okay, let's back up and go the other direction again. She's sniffing and sniffing. Watch when she starts to cross this little driveway. Watch her nose on the ground. She alerts to something. We wait. Watch her nose. She gets a treat. And then, boom, going this way, right? She is on a mission. She's sniffing something over there, but then she gets distracted by the person. Good girl, Chloe. Good I girl. interrupted there and gave her a treat because I really wanted her to be reinforced for seeing that person and wagging her tail at them and not barking at them, right? So there were a bunch of opportunities for reinforcing good behaviors. There were a bunch of times where the dog was on a scent that she decided, well, I'm going to go this way and then I'm going to cross the driveway and I'm going to sniff over there, right? Um, there was just a lot going on in that minute and a half. And this is a young dog. She's, I don't know, four and a half months old now. Um, and it was just a really nice minute and a half. I have a lot more video of that walk. Um, I probably videoed for seven minutes, but, um, you know, if there's time at the end, we can watch it, but it was just a really nice minute and a half of taking the dog out for a sniff. I saw on, um, when I was doing some research for this talk, I saw on the internet, somebody is calling it a sniffari. And I thought that was brilliant. Take your dog on a sniffari. Um, so again, you're walking your dog anywhere, just some small modifications on your part can make it a much more enriching um, situation for your dog. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about traditional games. I'm talking about fetching. I play fetch in the house all the time. Um, I don't use a ball or sometimes I use a ball. I usually don't use a ball. I usually use a tug toy or some sort of plush toy. We get um, a bark box every month. So we get new plush toys that we can throw around the house, um, which I really like. Uh, balls can be a little too dangerous. And then playing tug. Uh, tug used to be a taboo game. Oh, I don't, you don't play tug with your dog. It's going to make them aggressive. It absolutely does not cause a dog to become aggressive. If you have a dog, um, that is aggressive with toys, then obviously don't play tug with them. But if you don't, you know, don't have a problem, then just play tug. It's not a big deal. Uh, Elizabeth has a good question. I'm going to take time to answer it. How do you indicate to the dog what type of walk you're going on? That's an excellent question. I think when you need to sort of get some distance or you're, you've got a destination in mind, then you can use terms like, okay, let's go come on, let's walk some sort of verbal um, mark cue that tells the dog, okay, this is what we're doing. And then when you just are doing sort of a relaxed sniff walk, your body language is going to be the most important thing that tells your dog the fact that you're stopping and letting them sniff things. When I see people walking the dogs, the dogs will sniff something and the person will almost always tug on the leash and pull them off and indicate, okay, we have to keep going or um, doesn't even look back, doesn't even stop and let the dog sniff. If your dog snaps and sniffs, sniffs something, stops and sniffs something, just stand still and put some slack in the leash, walk back towards the dog and let them know you're not about to pull them and you're not about to call them away from their precious sniffy thing that they've found. And they will automatically know, oh, okay, well, let me try going in this direction. 
Now, of course, you know, when we let them choose the direction, I'm not saying like, let your dog walk you out into traffic, right? Obviously, there are some limitations. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Tell the dog, you know, okay, let's go if you need to be moving on. Um, or, you know, slacken the leash and move back into your dog when you um, are giving them time on their own. All right. Anyway, sorry. Back to fetching and tugging. Tugging does not cause aggression. You Also, you don't have to win. And it is okay for the dog to initiate. I mentioned these um, because these used to be the things that it was like, okay, don't play tug. It'll make your dog aggressive. And like, okay, you can play tug, but you have to win. And okay, you can play tug, but you have to win. And don't let the dog start the game. Like it was all these crazy rules about your dog being in charge when, you know, now we know that dominance theory is not really a true um, situation in dogs. It's, it was bad interpretation of some, some science back in the day. Um, and then there is actually a really awesome toy on the market called the flirt pole. For those of you interested, the best flirt pole I have ever seen is um, a flirt pole by Squishy Face Studios. You can get it off of Chewy.com. I think you can also get it off of Amazon. And I am going to show you, this is Biscuit, a three and a half month old puppy. This was taken a few years ago, um, but we were showing um, Biscuit's mom how to exercise this crazy energetic three and a half month old puppy. And so she was um, doing a lesson with us and we got out the flirt pole and said, look, this is what you can do. You guys can see the amount of energy that this little puppy has. Yeah, it is on a bungee, so you do have to be careful to not slap your housemates. We've got tugging. We've got chasing. The dog is bouncing. There's just This dog is having so much fun. Sorry, taking a little drink, right? So this dog, I'm going to play it again. Just having a blast. This dog has so much energy. Um, chasing the thing, tugging the thing. And I want you guys to look at the trainer. She's barely moving. You can play with a flirt pole from your couch, right? You can sit on the couch and be drinking a glass of wine. And at the same time, you can be exercising your puppy, right? It's just a lot of fun. Um, it's a really great toy. I'll mention the brand again. It's from Squishy Face Studios. So this is the Squishy Face Studios Flirt Pole. Um, and I think it is a great, um, a great toy. Um, oh, uh, Deborah says, your dog's friend has um, flirt poles. Um, for sale. If your puppy is afraid of it, Jennifer, that's fine. Um, you know what? You can, I'm going to show a video. Do you see actually in this biscuits got that little, um, fleece toy at the end. If your puppy is afraid of the flirt pole, then you would just play with that little piece of fleece toy in your hand. It doesn't have to be a big flirt pole. Obviously, everything I'm saying today is assuming that, you know, you, the dogs like these things. And we're going to talk about a whole bunch of things. All dogs like different things. Um, Jody says her puppy eats the rope. I do not, if you're talking about specifically those braided rope toys, which are just a lot of threads um, sort of wound together, I'm not a huge fan of rope toys. Um, any tug I use is usually braided fleece and not rope. Um, but the rope is on the flirt pole. Yeah. Um, you might get a different, oh, the, oh, the rope, <laughs> right. The, 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 the other part. Yeah. You know, maybe that's not the right toy for your dog, Jody. Maybe you're going to need, um, something else that your dog can chew on if that's what's going on. So here's another traditional toy play session. This is with my um, now older border collie. He's almost 11. This was a video back when he was five. And I'm going to give you all a warning. You do not have to be um, as ridiculously crazy and 
silly as the person in the video is going to be just for uh, a reference. This was a 10 minute play session in the house with this dog. And this is going to be with a, a braided fleece tug toy. And she's getting down on the floor with the dog, right? Um, and she's just playing some tug. She's getting down there with him. Um, and this is just showing the dog that, like, you're really there. Now, this is the part that's just ridiculous, right? You don't have to roll on the ground. She's just silly. She does this all the time. Okay, we've added in some fetching. Right? And then we're back to tugging. She's smacking the dog. A lot of enthusiasm. Yes. That's right. You got really excited, enthusiastic. And now we're calming down a little bit, right? Yeah, there we go again. <laughs> so this was seriously this, you know, we only only showed a couple of minutes, but this was a, a full 10 minute session with the dog. Yeah, it is good aerobic exercise for the person also. Um, but 10 minutes of play, there was some fetching and some tugging, some, you know, a lot of enthusiasm. And then, you know, at the time, the dog was only five years old. He's a border collie. He's a dog that had a lot of energy, still has a fair amount of energy. Um, and it was just, just a dedicated session to this dog, right? And it only needed to be 10 minutes. That's it. Um, you can, oh, what I wanted to point out was, yeah, there was a lot of, um, growling. She was, she was, you know, patting his side. That is a move from a really fantastic trainer named Susan Garrett. Um, and she used to have, um, she's got a bunch of videos and books and it was a, a game called smack the baby, right? And you just kind of, if your dog likes it, not all dogs like it. This dog did like it. And she was just patting his side and moving him around and just really getting into it. Um, yeah. So some dogs will, Anne says that she, <laughs> she likes it. The dog loves it, but it hurts her hands. This is another reason why I like a really soft um, toy. You can even get toys with handles for your hands. Um, but it was just a good example of a combo tugging and fetching session in, uh, you know, a small area that the dog really, really enjoyed. And then you can give them a bone and you've got quite a bit of enrichment in there. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about food games. Like I said about um, taking your dog for a walk, a lot of people are taking their dogs for walks anyway. Uh, another thing that you're doing, no matter what is you're feeding your dog, instead of putting the food in the bowl and having the dog gobble up the food in a couple of seconds, you can actually make that into some really, really easy enrichment. There are so many interactive dog toys available on the market these days. It is mind boggling. Okay. I'm going to talk about a few that I really like today. Um, some food puzzles. This is a toy called the Kong Wobbler. For those of you um, who are familiar with the classic Kong, this is the, on the right side is the classic Kong, just a piece, a large piece of molded rubber. I'm going to talk about how to play with that. They, there's another toy called the Kong Wobbler. And um, this toy unscrews, you can put some food in and then the dog knocks it around and the food comes out that little food um, hole and then your dog eats their dinner that way. Um, 
Susan asked if rough, if rough housing with your dog is okay. Yes. As long as the dog stays under control, right. That's a little bit different for every dog. Um, if you're getting bit or hurt, then no. Um, Brie Bowman has a 16 month old pit mix and she's wondering if it's going to work as a super chew for a super chewer. Um, the Kong wobbler is uh, very, very sturdy. It will probably be fine. And for anybody with a super chewer dog, a uh, really large dog, there are black rubber Kongs and those are a lot more durable than the red rubber Kongs or the little puppy ones that are pink or blue. Um, this little purple thing down at the bottom is called a uh, kibble nibble, and it's similar to the Kong wobbler. Uh, you unscrew it, you put the dog's food in the kibble nibble, and then there are holes at the top and the bottom, and they bat the toy around. I will say the two um, unfortunate aspects of the Kong wobbler and the kibble nibble is that when they like are banging them across the floor, they do tend to make a little bit of noise, um, but it generally seems to be worth it. Uh, this is a toy called a snuffle mat, and it is a bunch of, um, it's a, uh, what is it? It's, it's material, cloth material braided through a, a plastic grid, um, and it's like just a really fluffy thing, and you just put a cup of food in there and let your dog snuffle for it. I'm going to show you that in a video. Then this is last thing is called a lick it mat. These are mostly made out of silicone and you can take canned dog food or peanut butter or cream cheese or whatever, put it on the lick it mat and the dog lies down and we'll lick it clean. Right. Um, and these are all things that you can just set these up. If you um, have a lick it mat, you can also freeze, freeze them. Um, and it takes a dog a little bit longer to clean them out. But these are all time consuming things that your dog is going to enjoy doing. Um, going back to that slide about what dogs, you know, what kind of play they would do. These are searching games. These are, okay, I've got to work for my food games. Yes, Blake freezes the regular Kongs too. Yep. Great comments, um, everybody. I love it. So um, I'm going to show you a few of these toys in action. Uh, Deborah says they've got snuffle mats and a lot of these toys available at their training center in Rockville. And they're great presents, um, Christmas presents, Hanukkah presents, New Year's presents for people with uh, dogs. I would have to agree with that. Okay. So this is a dog that is um, a puppy that is uh, doing training at Woofs and when we have dogs that are with us for board and train or day school, we have them there all day and we do like 90 minutes of training a day and we give them um, breaks in between, either sleeping breaks or play breaks. And this is a puppy using a snuffle mat as a break um, during her training sessions. And I just wanna point out that it is not required that your snuffle mat matches your puppy's coat. You, you do not need to have a matching snuffle mat for each dog. Uh, this just happened to work out that way. And you can see there's dog food, just kibble. Maybe it's hot dogs, I'm not sure. In the snuffle mat and the dog snuffles around and finds the treats and eats them up. And it can take, you know, it can take a few minutes and maybe it takes them three minutes to finish. And then you pour another quarter cup of food on it and it takes them another three minutes. Right. Um, so that's the snuffle mat. Then we have, this is an easy one. You just get an old towel. We call it, this is a towel burrito. Um, you take a towel, you roll it up, but you roll little, this has got hot dogs in it. You can put any kind of treat in it. You want, this is little Tito and he is, taking a break from his training and using a towel burrito and there are treats rolled up in there and he has to unroll the towel in order to get to the little hot dog pieces. Um, it's a really, you don't have to, you know, buy anything. 
Um, it's just a really good game. I love that people are giving us suggestions for all their interactive dog toys. Um, Susan says, do you leave dogs alone at home unsupervised with puzzle toys? Depends on the puzzle toy. Um, I would be, um, you know, I probably wouldn't leave the towel burrito just in case the dog decided to eat the towel. Yeah. <laughs> Richard says his dog would eat the whole thing. Um, but the Kongs, the Kong wobblers, the kibble nibbles, I think I, I would personally leave my dog home alone um, with those things. Um, possibly, again, possibly not the snuffle mat or the towel burrito. Um, I think it depends on the dog. The tougher the, the thing is, the more likely I would be to leave a, a dog um, alone with it. All right, so I think I've got one more. Aha, this is the muffin tin game. You can see here we've got four different balls and we've got two open tins. And this is a great way of using, um, we're teaching this puppy, this is Chloe, how to do this. And so there's, there's food in, in two empty uh, cupcake areas. And then there's food under these other balls. Um, and so Chloe is going to learn, she's going to pick up the ball and then she's like, Oh, look, there's hot dogs here. And she goes back to the open ones. I think she just realized that there's food in them that she can get to. And then she's like, all right. Maybe I'll try to get these other balls out. Now that little blue ball is the hardest one to get, right? Because it's smallest. Um, but she is figuring it out. And then she's like, maybe I'll just play with the ball. And she finally got that one out. Um, and it's just something for the dog to do for her to play with. That little red thing is another Kong toy. Kong has a million interactive dog toys. Um, you can hear why we had the muffin tin on the old yoga mat. Oh, she got the ball, right? That's awesome. All right. Um, uh, Susan says her dog would flip the entire tray. You're right. Some dogs, um, go the definite easy route. Um, I thought I saw, um, Reese says she uses chewy boxes in the packaging paper to hide treats and she has fun destroying the box. Absolutely. It's like I was talking before about um, letting my dog chew sticks. She doesn't eat the sticks. So I do let her chew them as long. If your dog, an old pizza box is a great dog toy, as long as the dog isn't eating the box. Right. But you can put treats in cardboard boxes and let them destroy the box. It's a little bit of a mess. Um, but so is cleaning up the stuffing from your couch cushions or the, uh, wood from your windowsill that gets destroyed. And at least they're doing something a little bit more, uh, constructive. Um, Elizabeth said, should I expect to see mental relief after using a puzzle toy? Um, she doesn't feel like it uses up any of her mental energy. You know, it depends. All do Some dogs are different. Some dogs need a lot more um, exercise and uh, enrichment than others. Um, your, your dog probably is just getting through them too fast. You might have to do something a little bit tougher for them. Um, so we, you know, we will never stop finding the perfect enrichment for all dogs. So here, um, this is a very long video. I am going to um, go through it a little bit more quickly. Um, but these are just some simple food puzzles that I wanted to show you guys. This is a cup of food. This is, uh, we call this the grass. And this is a dog just eating the food out of this tall grass. This is also called a slow feeder. For those people who have dogs that eat their food too fast, you can use a slow feeder, um, but it just takes them a little bit longer. This is um, another puzzle. I'm going, you don't need to see me filling it. You can get the point. You put the kibble, you put the bones, 
you put it on the floor for the dog. Now, this is another one. If your dog is on the rougher side, I have seen dogs just flip this whole thing over and eat the food off the floor, which is still a little more enriching than um, eating out of a bowl. Um, a more delicate dog will do what this dog is doing, which is like flip over every individual bone. Um, this is just another um, dog puzzle toy that's on the market. I'm going to go through this. He is very generous, gen very gentle. This is the next level puzzle. Um, and you can put uh, treats in all of these little faces and then the dog has to turn the toy um, and get all those little levels open and figure out how to get it open. Now I would say that these are better if you've got a carpet or a yoga mat to put on because then they slide around. Um, yeah. Yeah, these are, these are the, a couple of people have recognized them. These are the Nina Otteson puzzles, and they are awesome. Um, I'm not sure what it's called specifically, but it is, it's called, it's by Nina Otteson, O-T-T-O-S-S-O-N. -S -S -O um, and you can see my dog is like, hey, lady, will you open this? Ah, Maya knows, this is the tornado. Um, and sometimes at the beginning, you, ha you might have to help them. Um, he's like, hey, can you get that top one open, lady? And I help him because I'm a sucker. Um, but let's see. Let me move forward. We don't need to watch this anymore. He eventually gets it all open. Here's an uh, example of the kibble nibble I was talking about. Same strategy. Food in the thing. The kibble nibble can be hard to put back together. And then the dog just knocks it around. Somebody said they put a tennis ball inside the kibble nibble um, to make it harder, which I think is a brilliant idea. Um, also, in the beginning, when there's a lot of food in it, the food com comes out really fast. Um, and then as it gets down to like, there's only 10 pieces left, they really have to work. Uh, to get the rest of the food out of the kibble nibble. But it's, it's enjoyable. She's having a good time. So yeah, so see, she's been at it for a while, and only one treat came out, right? Um, so as it gets less and less food in it, it gets, uh, takes longer and longer. Um, it also tends to get louder and louder <laughs> as it... Um, gets knocked around your kitchen or living room. Um, and then here, I'm just going to talk about how to stuff a Kong. And I know most people here probably know this, but a lot of people are like, I don't get it. I, brought, I bought my dog a Kong and I just don't see the point. The whole point of the Kong is to be used as a food puzzle. So for me, my basic Kong recipe is dog food and peanut butter. And in my house, we have two jars of peanut butter one clearly is labeled for the dogs. Um, and then I simply take a couple of tablespoons of peanut butter. I put it in the bowl with the dog food. And then you basically just stir, stir, stir. And for me, the goal is to get it so that all of the dog food is coated by peanut butter, right? Um, and then that's when you stuff it in the Kong. That's a little puppy blue Kong. Um, and for those of you with multiple dogs, you know that there's like Kong snuffing, stuffing day. Um, I stuff that in and then I cap all my Kongs with peanut butter on the top, right? Just a little cap on top. Um, and then this is what I'm, I saw that, um, Deborah was trying to show a, dog trainer's freezer. And I was like, wait, it's coming up. This is what a dog trainer's freezer looks like. You've got a bunch of stuffed Kongs in the freezer ready to go. Um, some people are more hygienic than me and don't put it in the same section as their food, but you know, whatever. 
Um, someone says, Dina says, can you use cheese, cream cheese instead of peanut butter? Absolutely. Use whatever works for your dog. Cream cheese, yogurt, um, cottage cheese. Uh, Kong even makes a, a squeezed cheese Kong stuffing thing. Um, so you can use whatever works for both your budget, your dog's tummy, um, and, uh, you know, something you can use canned dog food. If you feed your dog canned dog food of any kind, you can put it in there as well. Um, so yeah, use whatever works for your dog. The, the Kong is designed to be stuffed by you. So it doesn't really matter, um, what you put in it, as long as it works for your dog. Um, any tips or tricks for easy cleaning of the hard to get parts of the Kong? Yeah, I throw mine in the dishwasher if you have a dishwasher. Um, I throw it in the dishwasher. If you don't have a dishwasher, Susan says you can soak the kibble and mash it up with healthy fruit and veggies. Yeah, um, I'll be honest with you. I either put them in the dishwasher. I have a, a, a bottle brush that I use. And um, if it doesn't get clean enough, by then, then I just um, use it anyway, quite honestly. Um, they're dogs. They eat dead things. I don't really think a little bit of old dried peanut butter is going to cause them much trouble. But I understand some people are more uh, hygienic, perhaps, than I am. Yes. Yeah, so, Erin. Um, oh, an old toothbrush. There you go, Katie. I knew there was an answer here somewhere. Erin mentioned that she uses, there's, a, there's another toy out there called the Topple. Um, and I think it's T O P L L something. I don't know. It's spelled a little bit weird, but a topple is, ah, there we go. T O P P L is a great toy and it is definitely a little bit easier to clean than the Kong. Um, like I said, there's a lot of stuff on the market. I'm just like sort of touching, uh, quickly on some of the more common ones. I'm going to talk a little bit right now about search games. Search games, um, dogs love to search for things. And the, the toys I just showed you are search games, right? They need to get the food out of the thing. Um, so it's not so much a search game as a puzzle toy. A search game is more like I have to find the thing. And this is where games or sports like tracking and nose work are really, really popular. Um, dogs are natural scavengers. Um, wolves are hunters. Dogs are scavengers, right? Which is why um, countersurfing is such a problem with dogs. They are natural scavengers. That's what they were evolved um, from, not necessarily for hunting, unless it was a terrier, which they do tend to hunt. But dogs are natural scavengers. You need to feed them anyway. And this engages the instinct to hunt or something that's been called the seeking circuit, right? Dogs love to sniff and find things. Um, so if you can get into the sport of nose work or if you can get into the sport of tracking, once you know how to do it, you can certainly play nose work games in your house. You can certainly play tracking games in your house. Um, but one of the best thing dogs are good at is finding food. So you can take some milk bones or some of any kind of treat and hide it in your backyard or hide, um, you know, milk bones in different rooms of your house. Now, if you have a very destructive dog, I would not suggest hiding a milk bone in your couch cushions because the dog is going to be more than happy to do some destructive de-stuffing of your couch on its way to the milk bone, right? So definitely consider, you know, where you place the toys or the treats that your dog is going to search out. Um, I do like nose work. Um, you can just play with your dog finding stuff. This is literally a video I took this morning of a search game. So this is um, our dog, Primrose, uh, another one of our Border Collies. Oh, yeah, Matt, here you go. Scattering kibble in your yard. This is Primrose's search game. 
One cup of dog food, throw it in the grass. This is nature's snuffle mat, okay? Um, and then Primrose goes about eating the food that she's finding. Now, I just tossed it, right? So a lot of it landed in one spot, and she's just going to eat those kibbles. But once she's gotten all those kibbles in the one spot, she's going to have to search around in the grass for all of the others. And again, I want everybody to time this. Put one, one cup of dog food in your dog's bowl, put it on the floor, and time how long it takes to eat the one cup of food. Then take one cup of food, scatter it in your yard, and see how long it takes your dog to eat that. Because this took Primrose at least 20 minutes. Yeah, Jennifer, um, let me talk about that in a second. Um, sorry about the sirens in the background. It's always sirens near my house. But seriously, this is just nature's snuffle mat, right? Um, and again, this is my yard. It's a fenced yard. I know you know, that there's not going to be any da anything dangerous for her to find in our front yard, which, like I said, is fenced. I'm pretty confident that this is a safe thing. Jennifer asks, can this have an unintended consequence of teaching them to eat stuff they pick up? Um, yes, I would suspect that it could. However, I think most dogs are naturally going to eat stuff that they pick up. And I don't know that it's teaching them anything new. Um, and that the more important thing is to teach them to leave stuff or walk away from stuff that you don't want them to get. But, you know, like I said, this was in my fenced yard and I knew there wasn't anything else that she would, you know, get into trouble with. I wouldn't do this on a normal, you know, out on the street someplace I didn't know. Um, Jennifer asks a question, how do you work with two dogs and food toys and scavenging? Um, I put them in separate rooms in the house, or I put one, um, uh, the, the video I showed a little bit ago about, um, the trainer, Erica playing with Caleb, she was rolling around on the floor. There were two or three other dogs upstairs, not having that play session, right? So I would definitely separate dogs um, that and give them separate toys in separate rooms if that is possible. Because yes, if one dog is more clever or God forbid, you don't want to you know, get any fights over stuff like that. Um, if your dog already eats everything they pick up, is this one we should avoid? Yes. Um, if you're, if you're already having that kind of trouble, I would definitely not be doing this. Um, but again, none of these games are designed for every single dog. Um, every single dog is different and you have to make good decisions about what will work, um, for your particular dog for any of these possibilities. All right. So those are, that's a little bit on search games. Um, Last thing I think I want to talk about is training games. And I want to check the time real quick. Oh, three o'clock. Perfect. 310. Yes. I definitely want to leave time at the end. So training games. Training your dog is incredibly beneficial to your relationship. No matter what kind of training it is. I am always amazed that after I do um, some training sessions with my dogs, I find that they are um, much more responsive to me when um, in all parts of my life. So whenever I do any sort of little bit of training, suddenly the dog is paying more attention to me, more likely to do what I ask, more likely to come when called. So training is really, really beneficial to your relationship. Um, mental exercise is exhausting. Um, uh, raise your hand, you know, virtually if you sit at a desk all day and come home exhausted. <laughs> okay. Right. So mental exercise, um, can be really tiring and it's the same thing, uh, when you are training, uh, your dog. 
So there are a bunch of different, different things you can teach your dog. Obviously, there are things that we call obedience tasks or um, cues like sit down, stay, come. And because we find that these are really, really useful to living with our dogs, we put these in the obedience category. Um, and then there's a, a whole bunch of other behaviors that we call tricks because they aren't really that important to us. And these can this, I mean, there's a hundred million tricks, high five, roll over, fetch, spin, sit pretty, dance, jump, all, all I mean, whatever, I could go on and on. Um, so you can teach all of these things, but when you're playing a training game, I am going to suggest that you leave the obedience behind, right? Obviously, if you need to work on obedience skills, there is a time and place for that. Um, taking a class is a really good start. When you are just trying to tucker out your dog and build relationship, I am going to encourage everybody to train some tricks. And believe it or not, you can now get trick titles for your dog. So there is a fantastic organization called Do More With Your Dog. They have a bunch of books, 101 dog tricks, 31 puppy tricks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there is a great website, domorewithyourdog.com. Hang on, water break. that you guys can go to. And there is lists and lists of tricks that you can teach your dog to do and then get trick dog titles. Woof's um, dog training has a certified trick title evaluator. So if you teach your dog the right number of tricks, you can call us, our uh, evaluator can look at the tricks or watch a video certify that you've done it, and then you can send off the um, information to do more with your dog and you will receive your title in the mail. Um, it's really, really, really fun. And I'm gonna show you a quick video. This is Erica with Caleb again. She's our um, uh, certified trick dog evaluator. And this, is, oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Like I was saying before, when you're doing um, tricks or obedience skills, I want everybody to keep in mind that to the dog, they're all tricks, right? The dog does not put any more emphasis or importance on a downstay than they do to a rollover, right? To the dog, they're all just a trick that they do because you asked and it got reinforced. So, um, I would encourage everybody to approach their dog training as every single thing you teach the dog is just a trick. Because even I myself have gotten very frustrated trying to teach my dogs things I think they need, you know, heal, don't pull, don't bark at the door, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if we all came at it from a, a sort of a different perspective that the dog doesn't understand why we want these things, the dog doesn't understand why this is important, they certainly don't know that like one thing is important and one thing isn't. So to the dog, they're all tricks. Um, and try to be your dog's partner in training. It's not you necessarily teaching the dog to do something. It is you and the dog working as a team to navigate through life together in a way that works for both of you. Um, this is the session with Caleb. Um, this was the video submitted for his intermediate trick dog title. There is a beginner trick dog title that is much easier. I just wanted to show you, I don't think we had to videotape that one. I think you just, for the, for the beginner level trick title, you just have to attest that the dog can do it. And the beginner trick dog title is very simple things like, give me your paw, spin in a circle, sit down, come, stuff like that. It's really, really fun to get involved in. But anyway, this is uh, Caleb's trick dog title video. Let's see if I can't play this. Nope, hang on, what's going on? Ding, ding, ding. 
So I think this is not going to play because it was a YouTube, um, but I have a solution to that. I suspected it wasn't going to play. So I have it pulled up back here on YouTube somewhere. Hang on. Maybe I don't. All right. Well, it's not that important. I will try to show it again. Maybe I can show it here. There it is. Hope you guys can see this. Nope, hang on, I messed up. I'm not sharing anymore. Oh, Zoom, you think I'd be used to you by now. Hang on, folks, just give me a minute and I will get back to what I am supposed to be doing. Do -do -do. Do -do -do. Do -do -do. View, share screen, winter games. Here we come. All right, so jumping ahead, what I was saying to dogs, it's all the same. They're all tricks. Be your dog's partner. Your sessions don't have to be beautiful. Um, I am reminded all the time that the perfect is the enemy of the good. It does not have to be perfect. It just has to be fun. It just has to be interesting for your dog, okay? Um, it doesn't have to be beautiful, but you need to be nice. You need to use reinforcements um, and absolutely do not use any corrections or harsh words. I am sort of a crossover trainer, meaning I used to use harsher methods than I do now. I never used correction training as a professional, but I certainly did as a young person having dogs. Um, and it is very hard. I have had to train myself over many, many years to even stop saying, uh-uh, uh-uh, stuff like that. I have gotten much better and I now use absolutely no corrections or harsh words when I'm training. Um, and that is the trick for training games to be bonding experiences, right? If you're just frustrated and you're yelling at the dog during your training games, I am going to absolutely tell you that that is the time to stop training. So the last thing I'm going to remind you all is that there are five easy options to provide your dog with a lot of enrichment throughout their day. Sniff walks and food games are the two easiest because for most people, it is stuff they are already doing. You are already taking the time to walk your dog and you are already taking the time to feed your dog. So with a little bit of pre-planning, with a little bit of investment in some food puzzles, you can make those times in your dog's day a lot more um, interesting and enriching. Then tug and fetch, obviously play as much as you can. Training games, train your dog to do all sorts of tricks, get your trick dog titles. And then for those of you who are really want to do some really cool stuff, look at search games, look at tracking classes, look at nose work classes. Nose work classes are fantastic. It's a very low bar to entry. Your dog doesn't know how to do anything to do nose work. All you do is, is have to take a class and there are even some online classes for nose work that you can get started at home. It's really a lot of fun. Um, I hope this is helpful. Um, we call these big adventure times. That's another Susan Garrett um, thing that she used to say, you know, try to get some big adventure time in for your dog every single day and at least two or three times a week if possible. Um, you know, and, and big adventure time doesn't have to be hard. It could be walking along a stream bed instead of walking along a sidewalk. It could be um, driving five blocks to a park and letting your dog sniff there instead of walking in your neighborhood or just putting um, a, a cup of food in the front yard grass or scattered on the floor, you know, in your house, if possible. Um, big adventure time is big for the dog. It doesn't have to be really difficult for you. So I think, ah, some resources. Dogwise is a publishing company for dog related books. 
there are a million books about um, playing with your dog on dog wise, or at least 15. Um, the Sue Sternberg one I just got is really, really good. Um, there are, I think there's a Trish McConnell one. There's a bunch of really good books on dog wise. Um, take a tricks or a nose work class, or even just take, um, just take a very basic obedience class. Um, and then, uh, again, the do more with your dog website is really, really fun. It's, uh, easy to get started. Thank you. Have fun with your dogs. And I am here to answer some questions and um, have some conversation. Um, I had, I was looking at some questions. Let's see. Um, Anne says, does nose work or tracking courses work for dogs that don't have the natural inclination breeding for that skill? Nose work absolutely does. Um, nose work is uh, fun for all dogs. I mean, almost every dog likes to look for food and most nose work classes starts by having dogs search for treats in empty boxes. And so I think that's fine. I think tracking is probably a little bit um, more for the tracking breeds that like to do that. Um, I will be honest with you, tracking is one of the things I have never tried to do, um, but I have mostly herding breeds, so it's never occurred to me to do much tracking. Although a friend of mine has a border collie and she does some really good tracking with that dog. So I think, that could be, you know, I think it could be for anybody. Thanks, everybody. Um, I am willing to take any more questions. Um, let's see. Ah, Erica is our Wolf's uh, trick dog evaluator. And she says the trick dog titles don't need to be on video. You just need an evaluator to see them. Um, so that's good from her. All right. What else do we got? Let's see. Aaron says, what was the name brand of the green slow feeder that looked like grass? I have no idea. I have had that toy for, I don't know, 10 years. We just call it the grass. Um, I am not either, sure. But I think I've seen them at Loyal Companion. Loyal Companion. Yeah, they're, they're around. Yeah, I, I haven't seen it in a while. Um, I'm not sure. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop the share so that I can, let's see, see people. There we are. Um, let's see, where'd my chat screen go? Um, I've lost the chat. Chat, there it is. Okay. Ah, Erica found the grass feeder. She's got a a link to Amazon. Jody also posted one. You guys are awesome. Do I like herding balls for herding dogs? I Jennifer, that's a great question. Um, I have never used a herding ball and I have mixed emotions about them. Um, there is a toy on the market called a giggle ball, and I don't like that toy. Um, it's green. It makes some weird noises. I personally don't like the noises it makes. And I have seen some dogs get really kind of obsessed about it. And I've seen some dogs get really obsessed with those herding balls. Um, there is also a fair number, a fair amount of information online about dogs getting obsessed with flirt poles. And I think we have to go back and talk about, um, you know, not every game is good for every dog. And so I think if you see behaviors in your dog that you are, you know, concerned about, then that is a game you should not be doing. If your dog is becoming absolutely frantically obsessed with the flirt pole, then maybe it's time for the flirt pole to disappear. Um, if your dog likes a herding ball and they use it on occasion or you use it for some training stuff, I think that's great. But if your dog becomes really obsessed with a herding ball, which I've, I have seen happen, um, then the herding ball should not be out all the time. It should only be used uh, at specific, you know, for specific training or play sessions, and then it should be picked up and put away. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've seen some 
unpleasant things with the giggle ball and also with the hurting ball. Um, I've never, you know, I've never used the hurting ball, so I don't know. But I think anytime you see that level of obsession. Oh, let me add one last thing, which I forgot to put in. Absolutely nobody ever, ever, ever play with laser pointers with your dogs. It is not good for them. If you have a cat and you like to play laser pointer with your cat, you go for it. You laser point all over until that cat is exhausted. But no laser pointers for dogs. There is a fair segment of the dog population that gets obsessed with laser pointers and then they become obsessed with light and shadows as well. And it can be absolutely debilitating and ruinous to dogs. Um, and so I am just gonna add one last caveat, do not use laser pointers with dogs. Um, any other questions? Obsessed with tracing reflected life and shadows. Okay, Brie, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, how can you stop it? It is, it can be challenging. The first thing I would do is make sure that in your dog's daily environment that um, you're never playing anything that has light and shadows involved with it. Um, I would also probably talk to a vet behaviorist if you haven't already, um, Dr. Sin and Dr. Pike are both in the area uh, and I would probably talk to them about, um, seeing if there isn't something that can help your dog. It's worse in the morning when the sun streams into her kitchen, right? So what I would start with, with that kind of thing, and this is why we don't play with laser pointers. It can, it can trigger that kind of thing. Um, keep your dog out of the kitchen in the mornings, if at all possible. The other thing is we have um, some opaque sheeting on the windows that look out into like the front yard so that the dogs don't bark at passersby and delivery people. And you might consider putting, um, Erica, if you're still on here, if you can pull up what that opaque sheeting is, um, I would maybe put this, the sheets on the, um, they just stick to the windows and maybe put that on the windows in your kitchen so that it is more of a consistent light rather than, you know, uh, light through um, trees or branches and stuff like that. I think that could be really helpful for dogs that have um, sensitivities to lights and shadows. And then distract, distract, distract. Maybe in the morning um, is uh, pizzle time, right? Bully stick time in a separate room. Um, if you know that it is particularly bad from like 6.20 to 7.10, then it is um, pizzle time in a separate room during those hours, right? One of the first rules of behaviors that we want to change or, you know, want to modify is don't let them practice it. So I would be doing everything in my power to um, prevent the dog from practicing those behaviors. Uh, no, I have very few. So yes, of course, Abby asked, is there any questions, uh, any suggestions for stopping barking at mailmen and other delivery folks? So like I said, in the front of my house, we keep those blinds drawn. We don't open those up during the day. And we have this uh, opaque sheeting on a lot of window film you can buy at Home Depot or Lowe's, right? So the dogs can't see out. Then the other thing I've done with our dogs is every time they hear something at the door, I give them a treat. And I know this sounds counterintuitive, but what happens is the dog barks, you give them a treat and everybody says, well, I don't understand that you're reinforcing the barking. No, I'm not. I'm distracting the dog and making them understand that every time they hear a sound on the front porch, there's something in it for them. And what happens over time is that rather than barking at the sound they hear, they come and look for me. They look to me for a treat. Um, obviously it's a little bit more of an in-depth training uh, question that I can get into now, but the combination of blocking the vision um, from the dog and then reinforcing them for stopping barking or reinforcing as soon as they hear the thing 
eventually they stop barking and start just looking for the treats, which means you have to treat them, but whatever, it works. Um, I recently had to do this with a dog that we had for about two years before she went to live with somebody else. And it was infuriating. It was so annoying with all the barking. And it was really hard for me to say to myself, okay, you just have to reinforce her every time she barks. Because even as a trainer who understands how it works, I was like, trust the process, trust the process. And before long, the barking diminished and it was awesome. He used to stop for the treat. Now he continues barking even with the treat. Have I inadvertently reinforced the bark? It is possible, Jody. Um, I don't have enough information or I haven't seen it. Um, but you might need to add on, okay, so not only do you come to me and get a treat, but now you come to me, you lie on your mat, you do a sit, you do a down, um, and maybe sort of make it more, um, more interesting for the dog. He continues barking even with the treat. You can also treat in the back room so that the dog has to run to the back of the house away from the sound instead of staying, staying in the same area. Yep, give it a try. All right, anybody else? I think Erica put in a... Yeah, okay. That's one new message. Signed up for adolescent dog training. Can you bring some of the things up with them? Absolutely. Number one thing you can do with your issues is talk to a trainer. Yeah, the trainers um, will get back to you between classes or if there's, you know, like even by email, if you're in a class, just email your instructor and ask them this. We also have an adolescent dog webinar uh, video on, uh, it's under webinars, videos on our website. And uh, you may want to look at that also since you have an adolescent dog. Yeah, and adolescence is tough. I tell everybody the other side of two is really, really great. The first two years are very, very busy, but then it does get better. Uh, it looks like that's it for questions. Although every time I say that. I know she's a shelter dog box, still settling uh, in. It'll get better. All right, folks. I want to thank you. This has been great. Um, I guess you've read all of the thank yous in chat. Yeah, that was lovely. I'm so happy to be here and talk to everybody. Okay. And I will bully you into coming back. I'll be there. <laughs> Thanks, okay. everybody. Thanks for spending the afternoon with me for a bit. It was really lovely. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Laura.